it didn't yesterday, so that's why you get a second chance. Right. Okay, uh, thanks for coming. As I said, I, I gave the same talk uh, yesterday, so I hope it will be much better or, or even better today. Uh, so this is probably your last chance uh, this year to hear this talk. So my name is Michael Futch. I work as a software architect for Spilo International in the math and mathematics department there. Uh, Spilo manufactures casino gaming machines and casino systems. We design and develop the physical machines as well as the game content to be used on third-party uh, gaming machines. And in my department in mathematics, we are, among other projects, we're responsible for the mathematical game engine. That's what's being used by the mathematicians and game designers to define the rules of the game. Basically, everything that has to do with games being paid for and the chances of winning and, and payouts and things like that. And well, we integrated a Python interpreter into that to give the users of the engine flexibility to be able to extend the functionality of the engine with their own embedded Python plugins or Python scripts. So that's what I'm, what I'm going to talk about today. I will first go through a number of use cases. So just to explain what I mean by embedding a Python interpreter and why it might be useful. Uh, and then I'll show you the technical details. It turns out that embedding and extending Python have a lot in common. In both cases, you're using the Python C API. So I will first go through a quick recap of writing extension modules. I don't know how many of you had experience with writing extension modules. Maybe if you have. Right. Yeah, that's... It's even more than yesterday, I would assume, even though the, the audience was a bit bigger yesterday. So we'll start off with a recap of extending, and then I'll show you the technical details of embedding the interpreter. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the thought process behind putting Python into our game engine, the specific challenges that we faced, and how we solved them. Right. In a nutshell, this is what embedding a Python interpreter looks like. You take the Python interpreter, CPython in, in our case, and put it inside your existing C++ program, just like you would use any other utility library, like you would use XPAT for doing XML parsing. You put in the CPython interpreter to run Python code for you. So that's the simple concept. One of the prime examples of doing this kind of thing is what I call the word macro use case. So you're probably aware in Microsoft Office there is this embedded Visual Basic language that allows users to write so-called macros, uh, which is pretty useful. You can do things like read the data from a table in a Word document, put it inside an Excel spreadsheet, transform the data, and create a chart. Right. So very special kinds of functionality that you wouldn't want to hard code in your C++ program. So here's an example like what might a Python macro look like that would color each word in a document in a, in a, uh, in a different color. Right? This is exactly the kind of functionality that you would never write a feature for in C++. But if your users have the opportunity to write a plugin or a macro to do this, uh, then it, it helps them and it helps you uh, as the developer of the C++ program as well. So that's one of the examples. Another thing that's actually pretty similar is using embedded Python for testing purposes. The only difference maybe is that you might want to expose lower level classes of your application. You might want to give the plugins access to the low-level details, and they will exercise some functionality and assert on the outcome, things like that. Yeah, so it's a possibility, right? And game engines have been using built-in scripting languages for ages. Some have even used <coughs> Python 
like I think Civilization Four used Python to manipulate the the map generation in some way, and maybe they are even using it for enemy AI and and these things. And that's pretty nice because your level designers that you have on the project or, or the the game uh, designers, they are not necessarily software developers, right? Let alone C plus plus developers. So you can provide them with an engine where all the low level details like I don't know AI algorithms pathfinding and and uh, 3d rendering all of that is coded in C++ but by using an extension language you can allow level designers to define the enemy AI for example and that's the use case at Spilo we're not doing first-person shooters like in this example here but it's also a game engine with its building blocks coded in C++ and the game developers will, or the, the mathematicians in our case, will use the extension language. Well, why would you use Python for that? You could just as well prepare a C++ plugin architecture where your plugins are C++ DLLs. The, probably the most important reason why you wouldn't want to do this is the users might not feel comfortable or might not want to write C++ code just to colorize each word differently. But some of your users, I'm not saying all of them, but some of your users will be willing to learn a little bit of Python or any other simple language to get their job done. And that's very much feasible. So some users will want to do this, other users might not but still they can reuse the scripts and plugins that the, let's say, power users uh, will create for them. And also sandboxing might be an issue. I personally wouldn't feel comfortable downloading a C++ DLL again to colorize the words in the document when I know that the C++ code can do pretty much anything on my machine with, with my permissions. Um, the embedded Python interpreter can be changed so that it restricts the execution environment in various ways, which on the one hand makes it easier for the users. It's not so easy to break things or to crash the entire application. And on the other hand, it prevents lots of security issues that you might have. Good, so let's look at the technical details first of writing extension modules. That's the simple example of that. You have in the lower right corner your complex C function and you want to be able to import your C++ code like any old Python module and invoke its functions or instantiate its classes, use the global variables, whatever. Right. And of course we were using this every day many modules in the standard library, like the regular expression module, goes down to an extension module pretty quickly. Um, many language bindings of GUI libraries, things like that, are extension modules. Now, a C++ compiler generates CPU instructions, but Python only knows how to execute Python bytecodes, so these are seemingly incompatible worlds. The data types are also quite different. An integer in C is most, more often than not just a 32-bit number. But in Python we have a ref count, we have a link to a type class, and all these different things. So also seemingly incompatible worlds. The good thing though, Python itself is just a C program. Right? So it very well knows how to execute C code. In fact, large parts of the standard library or of the built-in modules are of course already implemented in C. Here is an example. This is the radiance function from the math module which converts an angle in degrees to an angle in radians. And as you can see this, this C function that it goes down to takes pi objects as its arguments and returns a pi object as its result. And this is the, the actual code. I think I stripped some error checking here. Um, the Python C API, so the, the internal functions of the Python interpreter, provide all the necessary 
utility functions for converting to and from um, pi objects, like pi float as double. Even if you have never seen this function, you will recognize, okay, this takes a pi object and converts it to a double, as long as the pi object really is a double. If it is a string or something, then there would be an error. Right, and it performs the calculation and converts the result back to a pi object. Now, let's go back to our simple function here that takes two integer arguments and returns an integer as the result. How would it have to look like in order for the Python interpreter to be able to call into it? Again, we have to change the arguments to be pi objects. So in this case, as this is a top, or a, it's just a function, we can pretty much ignore the self here. Um, it's, it's not a method, it's, it's a function. I think in practice the self will be a pointer to the module where the function resides, but we won't need that. So the arguments, both arguments are in this pi object, and the return value will be a pi object. Okay, so first step, find the Python C API function that will extract the values from a tuple. Pi arg unpack tuple will do that. We'll extract the two pi objects from the tuple and assign them to new uh, to pi object variables. That's the first step. Then we convert the pi objects in these these two pi objects to integers. Again, assuming they are actually integers. I, I'm not showing any error checking here. This would be would make the code a bit longer. Then we can call the original C implementation and have it perform its uh, computation. And then the result is converted back to a Python integer. And that's pretty much it. Now we have extended uh, the Python interpreter with, with some C++ code. There's a bit of converting before actually doing our thing and a bit of converting afterwards. This code will then be compiled into a shared object or DLL. There is some boilerplate code as well that's not really important or quite boring. Uh, you have to list all your functions that you want to export. You have to list all your classes. You have to initialize something, but it's pretty simple boilerplate stuff. You compile it all into a shared object, and there you go. That's, that's the extension module. So to reiterate once more, take pi objects, return pi objects, use the Python C API to convert, uh, and there you go. That's, that's an extension module. There are some tools and libraries that will help you write this boring wrapper code that I showed you. Uh, Swig, the simplified wrapper interface generator, is a tool that will parse your C header files or C++ header files and automatically generate the wrapper code for you. Uh, I find the tool pretty good. It, it works really well in the simple case. Uh, of course, it has its rough edges. So it can happen that in complex cases, especially when you want your wrapped code to be extra Pythonic. If you don't want it to just be, like if you want everything to be a real Python dictionary or a dictionary of lists of tuples of dictionaries or whatever, then yeah, you kind of have to struggle against the, the tool from time to time, but still works pretty well and we're using it for, let's say, mission critical extension modules at Spilo and works pretty well. Boost Python takes a bit of a different approach. It's a C++ library, heavily based on C++ templates. I think there is also a tool that will parse header files and then generate Boost Python code for you. I'm sure it's a very good, very well thought out library. We ended up not using it. Uh, it has quite, uh, it, it puts some demands on your compiler. So you have to have a fairly decent C++ compiler. And we certainly didn't have that on all our embedded platforms, so it wasn't really an option. But that's not to say that it's not a good, a good choice. So the next step would be going from writing an extension module to actually putting our uh, Python interpreter inside the program. 
So th this was the extension use case where the Python executable is kind of your main program. Your main program that runs your Python code, typically from a .py file. And your extension module is essentially a plugin for the Python interpreter. You extend the functionality of the interpreter, which still remains the main program and it remains in charge of, of everything. In the embedding use case, you have your application as the main thing that controls everything, and the Python interpreter is merely a utility library inside your application. Your application classes control the Python interpreter and use it to perform some uh, tasks. And conversely, the Python interpreter can call back into your application classes. Usually, of course, you will have the Python interpreter execute Python code in, let's say, .py files or in your whatever you call your, your plugin files. Uh, so that the plugins have access to the internals of the application and the application can use, let's say, callbacks in the plugin, for example. So that's what we're aiming, what we're aiming for. The very high-level example kind of gets you started. So with this, you can test whether your include paths are correct and you're linking to the correct version of the Python library. is just to execute a piece of Python source code in a string. You include the Python header, initialize the interpreter, and then, for example, use pi run simple string to execute a bunch of Python code. I would say that's already pretty cool, although you might as well spawn a process on the, on the shell for doing this. Right? But that's, let's say, the hello world of embedding the interpreter. Now let's try something more interesting. We have this C++ code here that reads lines from standard input, calls a Python filter that we don't know yet how to invoke, but it basically will allow the user to define a Python function that takes the string, transforms it, returns a new string, and then we'll back in the C++ program, we'll output the result to standard out. So the interesting function here would be call Python filter. And Users can do whatever in their uh, plugins, obviously. So that's what the function might look like. It takes an STL string. First thing we do, we import the filter.py module. So that's equivalent to the Python code import filter. It's just that we're using the Python C API now. Py import underscore import is the function that I chose. There are there's a variety of functions taking some flags or whatever, but this is the simplest form. You just provide the name of the module, and it will use its normal path lookup to locate the module, import it, and you get the, mo the module object as a pi object. From that, we can retrieve the filter function, because that's an attribute of the module object. So in Python code, you would just use get adder. And here we're using pi object underscore get adder string, which takes the plugin object and the name of the thing that we're um, looking for. And we, retrieve, we, we receive the callable object as another pi object. Then we prepare the arguments tuple for the function, which in our case will just be a tuple containing a single string. So this works a bit like printf. You have these format or these special characters that designate what data types to put in, inside the tuple. Now we have the tuple as an object. Then we can use pi object underscore call object to actually invoke the callable, passing the arguments, which will return a string inside a pi object. And we convert that back to a C string, which C++ magic will then convert to a SDL string. So that's it, very straightforward, actually. Again, what I'm not showing here is any error checking. So what if the filter function doesn't actually return a string? You have to react to that. And also, what I'm producing here is a pretty massive memory leak. 
because all the objects that were allocated are never freed. The reference count remains one. So at the end, you would usually call the decrement reference counter macro on the module, the callable, things like that. But I'm not showing that here because it wouldn't fit on the slide. <laughs> No, not necessarily. Oh, yeah. So the question was whether you have wha have to have a C function like this for each um, Python function that what that you want to invoke, right? Yeah. So in this case, it makes sense to have everything encapsulated in this single function that imports the module, then retrieves the attribute, calls it, and converts everything. Uh, in other cases, you might do it differently, right? You you're just using the Python interpreter as uh, your utility library. It remains there. It's, it's always there. So I could import the module in my startup routine once and then just keep the pointer to the module all the time. And then whenever I want to invoke a function, I would just call pi object call object directly from wherever I am. So uh, this is just you know, to, to have it encapsulated in a single place. But yeah, so it's, it's really that's the way it works. The Python interpreter is always there. It has its state, it, keep it, it keeps its state, and whenever you like everywhere in your C++ code, uh, even though it's a, it's a good question, I would, I would say, uh, or I, at least what I try to do is keep my original application code and all the Python C API wrapper code separate so that I won't insert random calls to pi object underscore call object in my regular application classes. So you have your regular application classes, and then maybe you have some um, some special bridge code, whatever, uh, where you actually do call in into the the Python interpreter. Yeah. So yeah. By the way, I'm I think we'll have time at the end for for more questions if I'm if I make it on time. Um, yeah, and the, the code that we just saw is roughly equivalent to this Python code here. We import a module call get adder, prepare uh, an arguments tuple, and invoke the function. And that's pretty much the task that you have when embedding uh, Python. Think of the things that you want the Python interpreter to do. Well, we are used to thinking about these things in Python. And then go to the Python C API reference manual and look up the equivalent Python C API calls to do all these interesting things. It's really not rocket science. It's, it might be tedious and error prone, but it's not something you need a degree for. In, not in Python, anyways. And just like with writing extension modules all the time converting between Pi objects and C++ objects back and forth, and also what you can do what I didn't show here, in your Python plugins, you might want to call back into the application classes, right? which I didn't do here. But actually, you just combine the extension module approach with the embedding approach. Just as we did it before with the wrap sum function, you wrap your internal C++ functions and classes uh, in this kind of extension code and register your extension functions with the embedded Python interpreter. And once you do that, you can just, inside the embedded interpreter, import your application classes. Works, works pretty well that way. So again, there are C++ libraries to help you with this. Boost Python, again, wraps the entire Python C API so that you don't have to care about reference counting. Uh, Python errors will be converted to C++ exceptions and all these neat things helps a lot. PyCXX is much simpler in that it doesn't use fancy templates. It's just, I think it does use templates, but not in this boost kind of way. Um, it's much simpler. I've tried both libraries. Again, we ended up not using any of those. Uh, in, in any production code that we have, um, just because a library always introduces another 
point of failure, right? When you port to a new platform, you suddenly have to worry about this library as well. And Python itself and the Python C API is very, very portable. So it works on pretty much any platform. Um, so yeah, I went for writing the wrapper code manually. But again, I would encourage you to take a look at the libraries, whether they suit your needs. Okay, so let's talk a bit about our experience at Spilo with, with the embedded interpreter in the uh, math engine. So the engine already had a built-in extension language, which was a very simple bytecode interpreter. Uh, very limited, though, because it had to run on ancient hardware, where you didn't have much memory, so we only had one general data register. There were no floating point numbers anywhere, and it was a bit difficult to use. So at some point, we had to write something better. And the choice was basically between writing our own scripting language, maybe with a parser generator, like use Flex and Python to generate some parser for your own scripting language. Well, but then the question is, how do you design a good, easy to use, easy to learn, powerful language when someone has already done the job? And Python already does that. So the choice, it was pretty natural for us to use Python. We, ha we already had many years of experience using Python uh, for our programs and, and <coughs> scripting tasks and all of that. The Python source code itself is very portable. That was um, an issue. And the licensing fit our needs. So that's also important. The, the licensing allows us to embed the code inside our, uh, inside our library. So that was a thing. Yeah, and generally, Python has a great community, great documentation. It was a very natural choice for us. Right, so essentially we created a fork of the Python interpreter. So the first step was just asking ourselves, do we use any version of Python uh, from python.org or whatever comes with our Linux distribution or whatever, or do we treat it as part of our code and do we uh, clone the entire Python code and check it into the same source code repository and these things. Well, that was obvious. We wanted to track the Python source code, a specific version of that, as part of our engine. So at some point, I took the Python 2.6 point something source code, added it to our version control, and we compiled it right into our engine. This way, on all the different platforms, we know exactly what code we're ending up with. Now, and the forking came in when we had to port the engine to platforms that don't have an officially supported Python version for them, like Windows CE version 5 or whatever. There is no official Python port for that, so we had to make little changes to the source code. And most of the functionality in Python we don't even need, so, or of the standard library, I should say. So whenever I had trouble compiling something in relation to the file system on Windows C, I just threw out the code. Right? This is not useful for, for patching in the, in the official uh, Python interpreter. So essentially, we created a fork. And chances are that we are never going to upgrade to Python 2.7 or Python 2.3, which in our use case isn't a problem. The users don't really care whether print is a statement or a keyword or print is a function, right? As long as they can use our application classes in a nice, clean syntax, they're fine with that, or they should be fine with that. So that's one of the reasons for uh, forking. We can make changes without having to worry about how that's generally uh, useful for Python. Sandboxing is another reason why you might want to create a fork. 
Uh, as I said, file system functionality that didn't quite compile or where I had trouble finding the right header files for them, I just threw out. Uh, same thing goes for functionality that's maybe too dangerous or too tempting for your users. There might be useful functionality that doesn't really create them big security concerns, but where users can very easily get themselves into more trouble than it's worth. Right? We don't want the mathematical game engine to open an HTTP server or whatever. So we just we can throw out the functionality. It would be even more important if you were to create a word processor, say, where documents contain plugins. There it's even more important. Maybe you want to forbid uh, opening of files or something like that. And that would be kind of hard to do. I, had a question yesterday uh, why we didn't go for something like restricted Python or, or existing solutions that try to limit the, the, the things that you can do with Python. Well, the thing is these are general purpose solutions or they are meant to be, so they, they work on top of standard Python and they try to give you control in some way. You can decide what you want to be available and whatnot. It's a lot easier if you just don't compile the things that you don't need. Well, that's one thing. You just have to remove it from your makefile, not compile that module. Um, but then even if you need part of a module, but not some other parts, or you want to restrict the functionality of a function, in a, maybe you want files to be readable, but not writable. Not, not that we do this, but it would be thinkable. You can just go in to the Python function that's responsible for opening files and not allowing uh, write operations. Something like that would be possible. So yeah, and in our case, it's mostly throwing out stuff that we don't need. Yeah, w one of the final issues, the questions that we had was, how do we allow users to debug their plugins? With a normal Python script, you can fire up your favorite IDE, PyCharm or Eclipse or Idle, whatever, and you can single step through the code, set breakpoints, evaluate watch expressions, things like that. That's not really possible with an embedded interpreter because the, the IDE doesn't know how to invoke your C++ program and, and step through the embedded interpreter. So my first thought was, maybe I can open up a remote PDB server or something and people could connect to that inside Eclipse and so on. But then I realized that's not really the, the user base that we have. They, they wouldn't be familiar with how to use Eclipse, let alone how to remote debug in there. So really what I wanted is something like Microsoft Office has, where you have a nice built-in script editor and a nice built-in debugger where you can single step set breakpoints. It might not be the most fancy debugger ever, but it works. It's simple and your users will pretty much be able to use it. So it turns out that Python has tracing capabilities built in, so you can register a C function with the interpreter, and that C function will then be invoked every time you execute a new line of Python code and also every time an exception is raised or a function is called or you return from a function. So you have these various points during the execution of the scripts where the C callback is invoked. And being notified whenever you execute a line of code is enough to implement single stepping, breakpoints, you just have to monitor which line you're in and if there's a breakpoint, stop there. So that gets you 90% of the way to a decent debugger. And the rest is finding out what the call stack is, printing the variables inside a stack frame, but that's also very easy. Uh, you can do this in, in a piece of Python code very easily because there are all these introspection features in Python. And just have to figure out what the Python C API calls are for that. And then you can evaluate expressions. It's, it's even better than Visual Studio or whatever. You can, you, can, you can write entire, you can have an interactive Python interpreter right inside your embedded interpreter. You can manipulate all your application classes while debugging. So that's 
pretty neat and in one of the recent additions to our game engine that I hope um, users are, are going to appreciate. Right, so that's that's basically it. Um, as this is a short talk, uh, I couldn't go into all the technical details, but if you're interested in the topic, I put up the, the article about the talk on my website. So you, you can go there right now and read up on, on this particular talk. And I'm planning to write a number of follow-up articles that provide you with more step-by-step -step instructions and, and tutorials how to actually do this whole uh, embedding stuff. Right, and I should also mention that our company is hiring, so if you're interested in any of these topics, you don't have to be an expert in embedding Python or in writing extension modules, but if you have a general interest in that, uh, we're hiring in the mathematics department where, where we're responsible for uh, the math engine and the embedded interpreter. So yeah, you can go to our website or talk to me after the talk and I can give you the details. So thanks a lot for, for showing up. So the question was whether we, or just, yeah, I'm, I'm learning fast. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was whether uh, we're running the Python interpreter on the same thread as the C++ uh, code and whether we can call back and forth between, um, or actually you asked specifically about accessing singletons in C++ from the executed uh, Python code. Yeah, in fact, I should also mention that now that you remind me, uh, our application is a single-threaded single, single -threaded application, which I like because it keeps things simple. It would actually be possible to have several threads of execution with the embedded interpreter. The interpreter is able to distinguish between various uh, uh, thread contexts, uh, but you will explicitly have to take care of locking and, and all these things. So we kind of avoid that. So we are always on the same thread as the main C++ application. So going back actually to this example here. So during the execution of our C++ code, or here would be even better, uh, when we call the call Python filter, uh, inside there we call into the Python interpreter. So that's we're on the same thread, so this will be will block the C++ code as long as the Python code executes. And then when the Python interpreter, the C code inside the Python interpreter runs, or the Python interpreter calls into an extension function that we registered, it will still be all on the same thread. So in, let's go back even further. So this wrap sum function, I could have the same thing when I'm embedding the Python interpreter. Um, and if I register it with the embedded interpreter, the Python plugin code will be able to invoke it and it will still be on the same thread. So it's nice and easy to follow along, uh, to debug that. So there's, there's nothing, nothing fancy like a separate interpreter thread going on. Right, so the I catch that you are speaking about a bridge or something. Right. Yeah. So the, the question is whether we are calling um, the Python code directly from the C++ classes or what the separation is between the C++ and Python worlds. So actually that's, that's only just a question of how to organize your source code. 
So everything happens on the same thread. You could just as well mix in the Python C API functions every, uh, uh, throughout the C++ code. So that's really just a question of organizing your source code. In our case, what we had was an existing C++ mathematical game engine with all the classes in place. And what I did not want to do is like go to 100 different C++ files and add a Python C API call there and there and there and there. So I tried to, to keep uh, to have only a very small number of C++ compilation units that even include the Python header files. Right? So when a C++ function needs to invoke something in the Python world, it will always go to that a component of the application, the interface to that C++ function will all be C++ data types. So I make sure never to pass a Py object into the C++ world, or let's say too deep into the C++ world. So it's yeah, just basically just a matter of keeping everything tidy and, 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 and separated, which will be a lot easier to maintain. Does that answer? Yeah. Mark? Right, so the question uh, was about the the error prone the, the error <laughs> proneness of uh, of the the code that calls the the Python C API. Yeah, that mostly comes from you having to explicitly check for error conditions um, and also the reference counting. So it's it's very easy. Well, as we all know, uh, it it would be the same with malloc and free, and that's why we prefer to use an SDL vector or something like that. So that these are the issues that come up. And as far as tips go, I would say use a C++ library that wraps the objects. I, I know I said we don't. But in our case, we also have the luxury of having code generators for some parts of the engine where we actually know what the functionality of the engine is. So we can automatically generate large parts of this error-prone code. So that alleviates the problem a bit. But apart from that, at least, even if you're not using a library, create a class that wraps pi objects and will automatically decrement the reference counter when it goes out of scope. That gets you a very long way. And as soon as you do that, it's much easier to react to errors, because wherever you are, you can just raise and you know that all the reference counts will be taken care of. Right? So otherwise, if you don't do that, you will be reluctant to react to errors immediately. So you will try to say, oh, yeah, I know that something went wrong, but I still have to do this. And you know that, that makes it error prone. Any more? All right, yeah, then thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And if the audio didn't work out, I'm, I will be happy to present on... <laughs> <laughs>